Okay, so, um, yes, today I guess I'm just going to talk to you guys about um, opportunities for aquatic veterinarians. Um, so we're going to be more than just a drug dealer. I guess um, I just got a call this week from a vet in Geraldton um, because a fish owner wanted some flagell and that's an S4 drug. And the only way that they can get the drug is through a veterinarian. So I'm sure he's probably rung around all different vets saying that I want this. But as you know, as a veterinarian, you can't dispense drugs without actually seeing the patient. Uh, so the vet then rang me to just get some background about what sort of disease that she might be uh, dealing with and what sort of what are the differential diagnoses. Uh, so if you guys are ever out in, in practice and you've, you've sort of run into this sorts of issues um, and you don't quite feel full bottle from all the training that you get through uni, um, you can always drop me a line and I'm always happy to help. So I guess when you get called out or when you are asked for this drug, um, you want to prove to them that you're not just a drug dealer, that you're more than that. So you can actually do some diagnostics, real ones, um, and then see where to go from there. So my background is I started off as an aquarium enthusiast. I used to go down to different rivers and lakes and even drains to go and catch my fish. Um, and some of the places that I used to tread, I would never even go anywhere like 10 meters close to that. Um, these places just had those muddy places where there's all this gas bubbling out and all these worms in the water. You know, yeah, it's really disgusting. Um, so I guess from a very young age onwards, I always knew that I was into fish, but uh, I never knew that as a vet that you could actually deal with fish. And I really, really didn't know until um, nearly when I graduated um, at Murdoch. Um, I got my first job in Tasmania as a fish pathologist intern. Um, and there I, I worked up a lot of cases dealing with oysters, uh, salmonids, abalone, um, and some ornamentals, and also did a lot of pathology work with wildlife as well, um, and also uh, your traditional uh, terrestrial farmed animals. Um, being in Tasmania, it was quite a small place. Uh, I was in Launceston, so it wasn't even Hobart. Um, the population size is about 70,000. Um, and you can tell, like, back then when I, I was working there, there was only one fast food chain. I think that was McDonald's, or oh, maybe that was KFC, but the first time they actually had Hungry Jacks in Launceston, uh, there were, you had to, there was a traffic jam for three blocks because <laughs> everyone wanted to go through the drive through um, So that's like, so I was really, really bored. So I started venturing out from where I was. I thought maybe I can provide um, veterinary services to fish just uh, outside of Tasmania, not just in Launceston. And so I hooked up with Baroni Aquarium, who's in Melbourne. Um, and I, I traveled there uh, for eight years in a row. First Saturday of each month, um, I was going there. And it continued on until uh, I came to Perth as well. Um, and what you find is that, I guess, veterinarians are not traditionally the first port of call for any aquatic animal health issues. They normally uh, go to the pet shop, or even if they try to go to a vet, the vet clinic would then refer them to a pet shop. So. Um, it doesn't really help you. So um, what I found is that having hooked up with an aquarium store, you get really good com complementary uh, work with them. Um, and they come to you and you get a lot of caseload as well working in a store. Um, after uh, that stint in Tasmania, I came to uh, Western Australia. I, I got a job here with, in the pathology um, department again as well. Uh, and on the side, I work as a fish veterinarian. So I work out, operate out of my car. Um, and so I, I travel to people's pet fish, uh, fish farms, uh, to the TAFE and, and other places like that. Uh, I also go to Aqua and provide consultancy there, look after the sharks and rays uh, principally, and also the sea dragons. Uh, I also do some of the pathology work uh, that needs to be done. Um, and I do these lectures at uni and the pracs as well. Um, and at the moment, um, I'm serving as a secretary of the Aquatic Animal Health Chapter of the Australian and New Zealand um, College of Veterinary Scientists. And this year, I'm also the president of the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. And my newest post is uh, as a aquatics expert on e-health pets. So if you ever 
need an urgent question uh, answered, you can tell your clients or whatever to log on there and submit your question. Um, so why, why do we do fish? Um, fish has, has got a really, pop, a really large population size. Uh, and if we have a look here, if we count the number of dogs or cats and birds, horses or terrestrial scaly animals and small furries, they really don't compare anything uh, like you do with fish. Like if a person has a house, they might have one or two dogs, but they might have 10 or 20 fish. Um, but I guess people don't always put a lot of emphasis on how much is a fish worth. Um, monetarily, it's not worth as much as a dog or a cat, but sometimes they can be worth even more because um, fish you actually have to buy, whereas sometimes a dog or a cat you get given uh, or it's free. Um, but it goes beyond monetary values. Um, some things you just can't explain. People just grow attached um, and it's part of the family. So uh, everything that you think of for a dog or a cat, you, you, uh, the same goes applies for a fish. Uh, but they also, yeah, they can be quite expensive. They can be just part of the family. Uh, they can be quite rare. Um, fish also has no population control pressures that can breed as like love is in the water. Um, there's no council um, impetus or people trying to say that you need to desex your fish. Uh, so fish can, you can have lots and lots of fish uh, and the hobby should be growing. Uh, whereas the dog and cat population tends to be declining in size, especially with people moving into smaller households. Um, and in a veterinary clinic, um, you can think of fish as an alternative income source. Um, it's a lot of competition nowadays uh, with a lot of um, clinics popping up here and there and also mobile veterinarians um, that might be taking your bread and butter, which is sterilizing, um, or not sterilizing, but vaccinations and some of the more common, like maybe pain relief type jobs. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot more competition. So you might need to um, create a, a unique selling point and this fish could be the, the one. And not only would you be dealing with fish, but once they, they come and see you and they like your services, um, fish owners tend to also be other sorts of pet owners. So they might start bringing their dogs and cats to your clinic. So, and the last thing is that it's something different, something challenging or something that you just enjoy um, and you can't really put a price or a value on that. It's um, something out of the ordinary and you get excited. So it keeps life interesting um, and yes, not so boring. Um, in terms of aquatic veterinarians, it's becoming more mainstream. Um, if you've got those, um, those like the e-how type things, uh, they have uh, places where you can actually um, oops, do fish veterinary questions and also the veterinary information system uh, network uh, they also have um, a fish sort of stream so it has to call it but how do fish present um, themselves to you they're not always just pets um, they can also be retail stores uh, like the Baroni Aquarium um, over here in Perth we've got Vibas, Morley Aquariums, Aquatics um, and a few other ones. Um, they can also be wholesale, so they might be buying fish in um, and you're providing um, sort of a population style uh, type of consultancy for them, or they might be a farm. So they might be farmed koi or goldfish or maybe guppies. Um, you can also deal with public aquaria. So in Perth, we've got Aqua, the Aquarium of Western Australia. Uh, in Melbourne, you've got Melbourne Aquarium, Sydney Aquarium, Sydney, things like that. So every large city tends to have a public aquarium and um, the likelihood, I guess, not all of them are being serviced by a vet. So there, there are still opportunities for you to get out there. Uh, you can also provide services to the food fish industry, uh, which include your aquaculture and aquaponics. So it'll be similar to your pig vet or a poultry vet or your cow or a sheep vet. Uh, you're giving sort of population um, style um, advice and consultancy to do with production, increasing production, uh, preventing diseases, uh, checking up on the nutrition and things like that. Um, other aquatic um, activities you can do would be at universities, education or training centres. Um, uh, I've got here a colleague, Susan Quay, she's running 
Uh, she's actually setting up a, a master's unit uh, to do with aquatic animal health. Uh, you've got a lot of research being done with conservation of aquatics. Um, and in the US and other places, you've got a lot of um, training things like um, aquavet, sea vet, marvet, uh, and things like that. Um, and so the next point is environmental and rehab. Um, you can try and investigate fish kills. You might maybe work in a government laboratory uh, offering services like that. And there's also the internet um, trying to, I guess for me, it's to put out good information that's reliable uh, and try and weed out all the misinformation that's out there. So there are lots of different roles um, or ways that fish present themselves. Uh, you just have to be look, looking. Um, but there are quite a, a few roadblocks uh, you may find. Uh, there's a lot of opposition uh, to veterinarians getting into aquatic animal health. Uh, traditionally, it's always been looked after by biologists. Uh, and if you remember the movie with uh, Finding Nemo with the um, seagulls, yes, everyone's going, it's mine, it's mine. But so there's a lot of sensitivities exist because a lot of biologists have been there way longer than we have. And so they've got so much more experience and accumulated knowledge. And so we're pretty much new uh, entrants into, into the game. Uh, so it's very difficult um, to try and um, convince them that they need us and that we, we can complement each other uh, rather than we want to take over their jobs. Um, so with strong oppositions and sensitivities, a lot of people are going to be working against you and they're really wanting to see you fall. So with everything that you do, you just make sure that you go back to the basic principles, make sure it's uh, scientifically valid, uh, you do your research and go with what you believe is true. Um, and yes, don't act out of a gut feel or something. Um, so. In terms of the biologists, um, they've got a basic degree, uh, they may have honours, masters or a PhD and a lot of experience, whereas with veterinarians, um, it's hard to get experience, so the veterinarians may have to do honours, masters, PhD as well, uh, maybe study up for their membership exams um, and also maybe get certified by the Aquatic Veterinary, uh, the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. Um, so this is just, I guess, the beginning. Um, I guess in the old days, you didn't have to do all this stuff because there were fewer veterinarians who are um, into aquatics. But now, I guess more and more, as I can see in this room, we've got maybe 50 people. Um, that there, there's going to be more, um, more competition. So instead of just having an interest, like when I graduated, I just had an interest. I just worked at McDonald's. <laughs> Whereas everybody was working at vet clinics or at the aquarium and getting real experiences, um, I was just really lucky to get a job uh, just be basically because I said I, I loved fish. <laughs> but it'd be harder for you guys. Um, so getting back to the point of veterinarians versus um, biologists, um, I guess we're, we're not trying to compete with them, we just want to complement them and we just need to be aware for ourselves that we have the credentials, we have the right training to make an accurate diagnosis. Uh, uh, making a diagnosis, prescribing treatment, things, those are acts of veterinary science. So uh, we need to sort of look after that and make sure that we, we do that and we do that properly. And the sort of training that we get um, from veterinary school, even though it's uh, heavily into dogs and cats, but it's all about comparative um, anatomy, comparative epidemiology, microbiology, parasitology, pharmacology, anesthesia, surgery, nutrition, physiology, pathology and toxicology, and, and the list goes on and on and on. So we're not based on our training, even though we may not get a lot of aquatics, a lot of what we're learning, the basic principles are gonna apply. And there is no other degree out there that will give you this sort of breadth of um, experience and training. So what sort of services can a veterinarian offer? Um, so I've got here aquaculture farmers. So if you think about food production animals, you can do site inspections, go to the farm. Um, you can make a diagnosis by taking skin swabs, skill biopsies and doing necropsies, uh, just like a, a cow or a sheep vet would do. Um, you can authorize export certification and translocations. Usually you need to be part of the 
government sector or you can uh, sit exams or tests uh, where you can be certified to do things like that um, on behalf of the government. And you can also be the liaison between the lab and the owner to interpret lab reports because uh, a lot of veterinary pathologists, when they write reports, they tend to write it for the vet and there can be a lot of jargon in there and you can be the, sort of the translator. Um, in terms of companion aquatics, um, I've, I've, this would include not just your pet fish, but also your public aquaria, so maybe your dolphins, um, your dugongs, your sharks and crocodiles. Um, you can do tank inspections or site inspections and you can pretty much do exactly the same things. You can have access to prescription drugs, uh, you can do surgery, imaging, if they have teeth, you can do dentistry, um, you can take eggs out of turtles if they're sort of stuck. <laughs> um, you can do everything and you can also play around with their nutrition, make sure it's balanced. Uh, and again, you can be the liaison between the lab um, and the owner of the, of the facility. Um, or you can even work in the lab. So how do you avoid conflicts? How do you get in without pissing people off? Um, so your in initial role, I guess most people's entry point, uh, as I said from the Geraldton vet uh, from this week, is that you, they look at you as a drug dealer. It's like, oh, I know what I need. I've done my Googling and consulted Dr. Google. This is what I need. But I can only get it through a vet, so I have to go to a vet. And most of them don't like going to a vet because um, they think that you charge too much and that you know nothing and that they know better. But quite often I found that that's not the case, that um, based on your basic principles um, and through um, corresponding with other veterinarians and your colleagues that um, you might actually be able to prove them wrong. And, and you can also value add. So they might be thinking, I want flagell because they've got this hole in the head disease. Uh, but when you do your skin scrape and gill biopsies, you might find maybe they've got um, gill flukes as well. So by throwing flagell at them, it's not just going to fix that problem because they've got gill flukes, they're going to die from gill flukes. So it's really great when you can actually uh, have those fines and then that's when you can prove your worth to them, that it, it's just not expensive, but it's really worth, worthwhile. So you need to show them what real veterinary medicine is and it's not just based on Dr. Google or just based on what you can see grossly because a lot of things are microscopic um, and it can be quite complicated. Um, so what else can you do? You can give specialist advice. Um, in a, it's a lot of treatment um, based on really old type drugs that's available because I guess uh, vets haven't really been in on this so a lot of drugs still use something like malachite green as an antifungal. So you might be able to do some research and find out some other different cures, uh, maybe different treatment trials, and, and you can just, um, yeah, you can actually make changes to the aquatic animal health because it's such a new field uh, for veterinarians that we can actually put, provide a lot of input into it and make a lot of change. Uh, we can produce uh, pathology reports and we can also give them advice on preventive medicine. Uh, as we do with um, nutrition, dental care, vaccinations, uh, probiotics and things that we would normally use in a vet clinic anyway. So how do you get in? Um, for the pet fish veterinarian, um, we have here you, uh, the vet in green, uh, in your green scrubs. Uh, you've got your pet fish owner. You've got lots of different, um, I guess, um, organizations or um, or bodies that you'll be dealing with. So as a veterinarian, you're central to all this. So you'll be providing a service to the pet fish owner. Uh, and in doing so, you may want to refer for some drugs that you, you might think it's not worthwhile to stock or that you want to create a good uh, working relationship with a fish shop. Uh, you can actually refer the pet fish owner back to the fish shop to get the medicine there. And in doing so, the fish shop will uh, think of you as not a competition, but that we work complementarily, complementarily, that they would actually maybe employ your services or they might actually uh, refer uh, more clients to you. Um, and for more complicated matters that you can't diagnose in the field, 
um, you would then maybe do uh, lab diagnostics and you get the results back and you report back to your clients. Um, as a veterinarian, uh, you can increase the veterinarian's profile as a fish health expert uh, by producing uh, writing for aquarium magazines, uh, attending fish societies and fish clubs, um, joining them. So uh, this Sunday, yes, we've got the Koi Society of WA auction. Um, so I've organized with Huini and Leslie, no, um, that, yeah, that we're going to be there and we're going to learn about the, um, the industry, how they, how they uh, deal with koi, why certain ones are worth so much, why do they bring home diseases, it's because they, they let them all swim together from different um, places and we might be able to do some diagnostics and when we are sort of present, uh, we sort of advertise our services that we're around so that they don't forget about us. And yeah, so it just, it's a two-way thing. So not only are we providing services for them, uh, knowledge and uh, material, but uh, they will also maybe provide us with clients. In terms of the fish farm, um, the only thing different, I guess, is you substitute um, companion with farmer and that's how you would proceed. How about non-fish aquatic vets? I guess you guys, some of you or half of you are probably more interested in marine mammals, sea turtles, maybe freshwater turtles, crocodiles, sea snakes, maybe invertebrates. Um, how, do you, how do you get into things like that? Um, if they are part of a zoological park, uh, then you need skills in zoo and wildlife medicine or exotics as well. Um, so by maybe doing your master's in wildlife health or picking uh, the special topic as zoo in your final year, that will give you some extra skills that would set yourself sort of apart from other veterinarians who are trying to get into the field because everyone loves dolphins, everyone loves sharks. No, <laughs> some do. <laughs> Everyone except for one person loves dolphins. <laughs> I'm on the borderline. I'm sitting on the fence. I think they're just overrated fish. <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to be fish. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so that's how you would get in because often like seals and uh, dolphins, they're not always just going to be in an aquarium. They might be part of like SeaWorld where they've got other animals or... Disneyland, where they've got lots and lots of other animals. So fish or aquatic animals are not going to be your full-time job. You're going to have to deal with other things. But then if they're part of something like um, Melbourne Aquarium or maybe uh, Sydney Aquarium, they're going to have fish as part of their whole uh, facility. So you would not only need to know about your marine mammals and your large critters, but also you might need to know about your fish and water quality. So, and also if you're thinking about sort of rehabilitating animals um, and conservation type things, uh, the plan of attack is going to be quite a lot different because nobody owns those animals and nobody is going to sort of foot the bill. Everything's going to cost a lot of money. So you need to be also maybe good at fundraising um, and have some business skills to try and work those things up. Um, in terms of rehabilitating animals, um, it's very, very unlikely that you would do so, especially without proper, faci proper, proper facilities. Um, I know uh, in Florida, there is clear water. I'm not sure if you've seen the, the Disney show with the, what's that? winter the dolphin with a fin prosthetic fin oh, tail yeah, yeah. so I, flipper <laughs> i can't remember sorry <laughs> that's very bad because i've been there but winter <laughs> is his name her name um but there are not very many facilities that is going to be like that that you can actually rehabilitate um a sick animal that's that large um, and the only way that they could do that is that actually um, that aquarium was going to shut down because there are not many people were visiting until they came across this dolphin. And after they made a movie out of it, so many people came 
and that's when they were able to upgrade the facilities um, and it's gone become vibrant again so I guess if you are into movies and things like that and you can do something like this for a sick turtle um, all the better it's a great way of fundraising so for non-aquatic non-fish aquatic veterinarians um, if you're thinking about the larger animals um, so you need to be sort of multi-skilled um, you need to know about your uh, maybe your elephants as well your tigers and things or whatever is you think that would be kept uh, together in the whole facility uh, you might need to have some pathology skills where you can actually um, interpret blood levels um, because there are not a lot of um, reference ranges for blood parameters so you might have to create your own um, you have to be good at taking blood um, and I guess you need to do a lot of volunteer work because um, there's so much competition. Uh, most people don't actually have to pay people. They just want to come and do it. Uh, so I guess if you're really into it, um, make sure that you schedule in into your busy schedule that some time uh, will be dedicated to th this sort of volunteer work. Um, I guess in Perth uh, with the uh, freshwater turtles, the, the, the long-necked ones. Uh, there are quite a few different uh, parties that are sort of dealing with those freshwater turtles. So you've got, um, what have we got? Okay, we've got Water Grove Veterinary Clinic. Um, they work with the uh, turtle rehabilitation carer. Uh, they provide a lot of the medicine and med medical workup uh, for any sick or injured turtles. Um, and also advice, uh, whereas when they die, they go to the pathology lab and that's where I will do all the necropsy work, uh, histopathology, bacteriology, and I'll report back those results to Water Grove Veterinary Clinic uh, and also to the wildlife carers. Um, but those that are having to be managed uh, in the wild, so in Marmion Lake recently, um, there was an eradication program of uh, exotic um, catfish that was going to be sort of suspected that it might cause toxicity to the turtles. So the wildlife carers grabbed all these turtles out of the lake before they poisoned the lake. Uh, and then they rehabilitate or they held them at UWA uh, facilities. Um, and there's another vet uh, called Amy Northover. She uh, works at Murdoch Uni as a conservation veterinarian biologist. So she was sort of overseeing that, that sort of thing. So I guess there are many aspects for, for wildlife um, type conservation things that you can do. So you don't always have to think that I want to be just a clinical vet. You may want to be the pathologist. Uh, you might want to oversee the bigger project. Um, or you could even set up something in your backyard where you can actually care for them. Um, okay, um, and I guess in this day of um, information age with the internet and things like that, uh, which didn't quite exist when I was going through uni, um, there is a lot of things uh, with emails, websites, social media and publications. Um, you can actually start right now writing your own articles, creating a website, uh, because the longer you are on the internet, uh, the more you'll be searchable and found. And the more you write um, a blog or something, um, the more you're going to become, in terms of Google anyway, an authority on that subject. Um, so if you've got any spare time, you can start, start this sort of network. And if you're really into this social media type thing, so you have your website, and on your website, you'll have all these social media buttons. Uh, and on there, you would also want uh, to have your blog maybe mirrored on there or published directly to your website. Uh, and with this blog, uh, WordPress, it's really good. Um, you can actually automatically uh, sort of push out any information to all these other things. Um, so Google+, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So you don't need to double or quadruple your work. You just write your blog in here, and then it can automatically push it out to all these other sources. And that's how, I guess, you build uh, your network because in the old days, it's, it used to be the saying about it's not 
what you know, but who you know. But in these days, it's not who you know, but who knows you. So uh, you need to get out there and start publishing. So other avenues of trying to get into aquatic animal health. Um, so we've talked a lot already about the pathology aspects. So um, I actually had a picture that but I thought it might be too gory. Um, not too gory for you guys, but if I was to put this on YouTube, um, I think it'll have to be R-rated or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can concentrate on other aspects of veterinary science that may be more specializing uh, for vets and not uh, for like a more general biologist type thing. Uh, you can also maybe look into epidemiology. Uh, welfare is a really up and coming hot topic. So there's going to be more and more call for veterinarians into getting into that area. Um, toxicology, especially with a lot of chemicals that are being used uh, around the place, it's affecting the ecosystem. And if you want to try and uh, help to create a cleaner environment for our kids, um, you might want to consider maybe um, going down the toxicology track uh, with aquatic uh, systems in mind. Uh, you can also do a PhD and do research. You can also do policy work. So um, policy work, uh, I guess people think paper pushing and the most dangerous thing apart the, uh, as part of their job is a paper cut. Um, but they, they do uh, play an important role in government, uh, writing legislation, um, operating procedures and things like that uh, to protect our environment and make sure that we don't get any um, exotic pests and diseases that might cause uh, great harm to our country. Uh, and then there's also the conservation and environment element, which I guess ties in with policy, research and toxicology, epidemiology and pathology. So this next part of the um, presentation, I'm just going to take you through uh, with some of the aquatic veterinarians that are in, that are in Australia, so uh, real ones that you may meet virtually, uh, and also some from overseas. So this is probably the, the role that I guess the Mua people are probably more interested in. Um, so we've got David Blyde, he's in, working in SeaWorld in Queensland. Uh, and there, as part of the collection, they've got sharks, they've got dolphins, and they've got a lot of other critters there as well. So he works as a uh, facility aqu aquatic veterinarian. He works up, maybe does x-rays. Uh, this one, I think he's removing this large rod out of this shark. Um, this is probably a, a wild shark that he was saving. So uh, working in a large facility like SeaWorld, not only do you work on animals that are within the facility, but they will call on, on your expertise to go out um, to help wild animals as well. Um, and how he got into um, aquatics is that he has done his memberships in um, zoo medicine. Yep, it's a fairly new one. And he's also really involved with the unusual and, and exotic pet special interest group uh, of the AVA. Um, and he sort of gained knowledge uh, through things that he did um, to get a job like that. Uh, then there are other types of facility uh, veterinarians. Um, and this guy uh, is Rob Jones. He's based in Melbourne and he works, uh, he's employed by uh, Melbourne Aquarium to look after their fish um, in there. And he's got a new recruit. I'm not sure if you know Brett. Uh, he's a recent graduate of Murdoch, I think one or two years. Uh, and he's working with Rob, and he's uh, really full bottle on, um, on aquatics. He actually had a fish farm in a shed in his backyard, and he actually made money out of it to help pay for his veterinary degree. So he's very resourceful. Uh, what you'll find is that a lot of aquatic vets are really quite resourceful. Um, so so these, these guys are pretty good. Um, then you've got your mobile veterinarian. So you've got me uh, in Perth, and you've got uh, Sandy Wiperlan in as the visiting vet um, in Melbourne. So um, so far, because I guess now that I've got a young family, I can't do the monthly trips to Melbourne anymore. So I've sort of handed that over to Sandy, uh, who operates a mobile clinic, and she uh, visits that uh, aquarium shop. Uh, on a regular basis, uh, whereas I just tend to stay put here now. Um, but 
if we consider doing mobile veterinary uh, science you know, services, uh, because I guess uh, it's quite difficult. Um, there are a lot of clinics, um, and now that you guys are having larger class sizes, there will be a lot more competition uh, for jobs. So maybe you might consider creating your own job by becoming a mobile veterinarian. Uh, the overheads are a lot less, uh, so you don't need to have as many clients and you don't have to work as hard. <laughs> um, and you should be able to uh, make a, a reasonable living as a mobile veterinarian. I think there are about a couple in Perth as well, uh, driving around the place. And I guess the, also the benefit of being mobile is that um, your clients don't have to come to you. you can, your, your hinterland is like really wide. So I've got um, clients um, north up in Karabuda and Two Rocks, um, as far north as that, as far east as Ellenbrook, um, Armadale, and south to Mandurah, Rockingham. Um, yeah, so it's good. All right. Um, in terms of aquaculture veterinarians, um, I guess you've got um, some veterinarians here are, that deal with production um, animals. And so you've got Matt Landos, who works, uh, who's got his own company, Future Fisheries Veterinary Consulting, and Alistair Brown, um, who's got Smart Aqua. And they go out to fish farms um, on a regular basis. So they say maybe every month I'll drop by, um, check your figures, make sure that they're all going well, uh, try and troubleshoot when, when they occur, um, if you've got uh, diseases, you may have to medicate, so you'd have to uh, organize drugs and work out withholding periods because a lot of drugs are not registered for use in food fish. Uh, you're using a lot of things off label, so you need to do a lot of research uh, and get APVMA approval before you use the drugs. Um, and then you've got a lot of veterinarians who start off life as a fish pathologist. So myself and Matt Landos, we we knew, Matt worked in New South Wales and I was in Tasmania. We, worked, we first got our job as a fish pathologist. Um, and these are the guys are, working, are currently working as fish pathologists. So we've got um, Ian Anderson, Rachel Bowater, and Roger Chung. Uh, they're all in Queensland, um, servicing the industries out there. Uh, in Western Australia, we've got Fran Stevens and Joe Bannister. Joe is also a recent graduate uh, from Murdoch Uni. Um, and so you might think um, maybe you want to do pathology. Um, gradu when I graduated and I got the job, or I was applying for the job as a fish pathologist, I was thinking, man, I really, really hated pathology. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't even look through the eye pieces with two eyes at the same time. And I was thinking, I'll just use one eye. <laughs> It took me six months, so I got it in the end, and it's, it's worth doing that, um, <laughs> persisting, because um, before you know it, it's, uh, I've been working like more than 10 years as a pathologist now, so uh, it really helps that you can look at it through two eyes at the same time. <laughs> um, and then you can also do research. So if you're finding, because I guess the most difficult thing is not to get the degree or to find um, um, what do you call it, courses to do, um, but it's to get the experience and also the networking. Um, and so you can think about uh, maybe doing a PhD or a master's or an honours. Uh, so we've got Erin Kelly, she's a PhD candidate, uh, first year this year. Uh, she was also on the Vet Life Vet Show, the Vet Show on ABC. Um, so she's famous, so if you see her around, say hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a great way of getting your credentials. Um, Especially, I guess, nowadays with the field being more and more uh, competitive, um, people want PhD um, more. Yes, I haven't got one yet, but maybe later on. Um, and then you've got, um, I'm not sure you probably would have known Nahid. She is a veterinary pathologist here, does lecturing, and she's also enrolled in a PhD, and her um, her topic is uh, diseases in um, dolphins. So, so she gets to deal with um, dolphins that come into the postmortem room, uh, deal with the media. That's a picture I, I stole from one of the newspapers. 
Um, and also she gets to deal with conservation issues um, when you've got strandings and things like that. Uh, what do you do? How do you euthanize it? Um, so, so yeah, so don't restrict yourself by thinking that I only want to deal with animals clinically. Uh, then you've got uh, Dr. Susan Kui. Um, she's a lecturer here at Murdoch Uni and she started off her life as a veterinary fish pathologist for the Singapore government. Um, and also she did her master's in uh, aquaculture at the University of Stirling. Um, so she's got pretty good credentials and she's just finished a PhD on diseases of barramundi. And overseas, um, this is one of the youngest vets that are dealing with aquatics on their own. Uh, I think she's been out for maybe two years uh, and she offers a mobile veterinary service. Um, it's a very, very long name. It's called the Aquatic Veterinary Services of Northern California. So if you do want to go out and become a mobile vet, uh, don't choose a name that long because people are going to find it difficult to try and Google you. Um, and this is, what, this is one of the few things I could find of her. Um, you can also do a lot of training. So here we've got um, Donald Strem. Uh, he oversees or overlooks the, a program called Aquavet. So they've got uh, Aquavet 1, 2 and 3. So 1 is a four-week course uh, where you deal with the biology side of all sorts of aquatic animals ranging from your invertebrates like your corals, clams, all through to your marine mammals. Uh, so you're getting your fundamentals there. Aquavet 2 is your pathology program, where it's a two-week intensive course uh, where you start at 8 and finish at 9 or 10 at night. Um, it's pretty intensive, and all you look at are uh, PowerPoint slides and glass slides. PowerPoint slides and glass slides. But, you know, we are really passionate about it. We didn't complain. Everyone's doing it, and the food was great. Um, and then that's Aquavet 3, which I think is a two or three week program where you actually get out to deal with um, all these larger aquatic mammals, uh, seals, dolphins, and you get to swim with them. Um, you actually get to ride them and things like that. So that, that's a really good program. Uh, there are other programs like Sea Vet um, that's more a tabletop lecture type thing, um, but with a little bit of practical as well. Uh, then you've got Marvet and things like that. All these are in the US. So if you're fortunate enough, I got to go to Aquavet and CVET. Um, I applied for some grants. So uh, keep a lookout for any grants that can help you get there. Um, and here we've got Stephen Reichley or Reichley. And he's a fairly new graduate. And he's done, um, he actually started as a Bachelor of Science first. Uh, and then he enrolled in a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, Medical Medicine. Um, and now he's um, enrolled in PhD. So uh, if you don't mind studying, you can keep studying and getting a lot of experience um, that way uh, and then be able to come in and say, look, I've got some um, credentials, I've got a lot of publications, I'm legitimate and I'm really into fish, so no one can tell me otherwise. And we've got Nick St. Ern. Um, he's the, currently the treasurer of the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, and he is actually um, working for a really large um, chain of pet stores called PetSmart. And he looks after the uh, fish facility side of things. So he, he goes to the fish farms, um, distributors and retailers. And he's also got his own private clinics, uh, clinic patients as well. So, um, that's really, I guess, as you, if you have a look at the uh, breadth of things that the aquatic vet has to do, they basically have to be jack of all trades. So um, don't um, throw out any of your notes when you get through uni because it might be useful later on. So how do you get into the field? So you need to be willing to move to where the uh, facility is or where the job is. Uh, if you're into fish farms, they tend to be more in remote areas. So you need to be able to live in somewhere like Launceston, which at that time didn't even have a Hungry Jacks. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to maintain an interest in really key veterinary aspects that 
uh, maybe your uh, standard biologists and things don't get. So I really honed in on, um, on pathology because that really opens up your world to do anything. Um, I've got a colleague in the US who's really, really into frogs, but who's gonna pay for a frog to get cured or whatever? So, and especially in the forest, uh, they're just dying like flies. Um, you, they might get extinct. So he wanted to deal with frogs and he did, um, he was studying for his pathology board exams and he passed that. And he thought that he'll work with wildlife, with zoos and concentrating and trying to specialize in frogs. Um, and you also need to meet key people. And how you can do that is um, there's aquavetmed.info. Uh, you can register yourself there for free. Um, and you can also look at the list of other veterinarians in aquatics uh, that are listed there and try and make contact with them. Um, and I've also got my blog. Uh, you can actually sign up um, and you get roughly daily posts. I try not to spam too much. Uh, uh, so informative or amusing things. Uh, you can also join the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, that's got aquatic veterinarians. Um, if you are a nerd and know your fish, the authors of fish texts, you've got people like Greg Lubart, um, Ron Roberts, Hugh Ferguson, um, and other names, other big names that you, you think, oh, maybe these guys have actually passed on, but they're actually still alive and you can actually get to meet them. Uh, I actually met Ron Roberts um, just a month ago and it was really great. Um, I found another fish geek. <laughs> um, you can also do your exams and certification. So with the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists, um, the um, things that you might be interested in is the aquatic animal health chapter, uh, zoo and wildlife medicine, or the unusual and exotic pet special interest group. Oh no, not special interest group, but unusual and exotic pets um, chapter. So you can study up for your exams in there. Um, and you've also got your, the American diplomat course. Uh, that's the American College of Zoological Medicine. Uh, that enables you to be registered as a specialist. Uh, you can also seek higher education. So Murdoch has got quite a few different um, topics that you might be interested in studying. Um, and you can also um, buy books on it. And courses. Um, these are just a selection of the books that are actually written by veterinarians, for veterinarians. So um, if you're really interested in aquatic animal health, uh, you can't go wrong with any of these. Um, I particularly like this one, the um, self-assessment color review of the ornamental fish because it, it's got maybe 300 cases in there, which is, only takes you a minute to read each case. And by the time you reach the end of the book, you've probably got maybe up to 10 years of experience in fish cases alone. Um, and then you've got all your other ones. Uh, if you're into fish pathology and uh, work and live in a lab, uh, these two books are really good, Fish Pathology and Systemic Pathology for Fish. Um, and if you're interested in the MIMS type system where you want just the drugs because you know what you're doing uh, and you want to see what alternative drugs are there and what the dose rates are, this is a really good uh, quick look into it. Um, and I guess all these other books are really good for your general practitioner um, to sort of uh, see what to do when you, when you diagnose a case. Um, and this last one is a DVD. I think I've shown some of you uh, bits and pieces of it. It's got um, basically, uh, I have not, not seen anything like it apart from the one I've made, uh, where I actually show you how to inject a fish, how to take a gill biopsy. So all the practical aspects, how do you actually medicate a pond? How do you mix medicine into the food and things like that? So um, I guess that you might buy all these textbooks and you may not read it, so the information's not there, but um, people are more interested. I guess if they get stuck on a computer issue, uh, they're more likely to go to YouTube than to the help menu that's on there. So I think that, that uh, sort of wraps up the lecture. Um, so this Sunday, we've got um, this koi auction. So if you are interested, uh, contact Huini. She'll uh, let you know more details and apart from that, um, thank you very much.
welcome. Oh, yeah.